accountability. Thank you, Davis, for the great introduction to accountability. <laughs> Personally, the word's become a regular word in my vocabulary, so I decided to look at the definition and I came up with several li liable to be called to account for one's actions, answerable, obligated to account for one's act, and responsible. Survey to the parents. What does accountability mean for you and for your child with special needs? Some comments, I attached all of the comments that I got verbatim in the attachments, but some of them were worth noting. Accountability in a special ed context emotionally sound reasons for the policies, practices, recommendations, and denials that professionals develop and follow on behalf of and in the service of students with special needs. Maintaining adequate and transparent written documentation of its professional actions and following appropriate public access for auditing and reviewing such documents. Um, to me, the district being accountable means they don't let their students fall through the cracks. They make a sincere effort to identify, develop a plan to meet child's needs to the best of their ability. The district needs to document their efforts by assessing in all areas of suspected disability, providing appropriate services and documenting progress. Data. There'll be a collection of true data of a child's progress and that the tools being used to measure that child's progress are such that they accurately reflect, reflect the child's strengths and weaknesses so that an accurate plan of the next steps can be followed. Accountability should include an effective, quantifiable training program for teachers and an immediate partnership with private companies to remediate those kids who have been so negatively affected by a decade of fickle and detailed inadequacies. I just wanted to also make a note that none of these people are the people that are sitting in this room tonight. These are all parents who don't come to the board meetings. Our kudo of the month goes to Dr. Sally Kingston. Uh, the SEAC parents wish to celebrate her forward out of the box thinking that we know will enable Harding students to become even more successful in the future. It's admirable that she accepted a school with so many challenges and looked for ways to implement change. The preschool that's on campus will soon be one of the best in our city. I really believe that. Her dedication to parents, children, and her staff is to be commended. Her commitment to improving education should be an example to all district staff. Last but not least, our quote for the month. The ancient Romans had a tradition. Whenever one of their engineers constructed an arch, as the capstone was hoisted into place, the en engineer assumed responsibility for his work in the most profound way possible. He stood under the arch. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Before I jam. <laughs> Thank you for being so involved. F3, update on special education. Carrie Mills, our director of special education, soon to be executive director of special education, will make this presentation. Good evening, Dr. Sarvis, Ms. Sawaski, Mr. Smith, and board. I'm going to talk about two subjects tonight. I'm going to give you an update on the self-review, and I'm also going to give you an update about the stakeholders meeting that we had yesterday. So just coming back to the self-review, there were some questions um, about my presentation last time, and so I wanted to give you some additional information. First, the, the, basically the reason that I went over the process of the self-review was that it is so intensive, um, and I don't believe that in this district uh, there has been such an intensive process before. Um, so I really wanted to make you aware of the process and, and everything that the staff is doing uh, we really are looking for every, everything that we can improve. So that is why I wanted to let you know about that. Um, if done with fidelity, as I believe we are doing, um, it's really a very comprehensive and time-intensive process, but it does have good results in that uh, just today we had uh, the second of our corrective action in-service meetings for the staff. And so today about 75 of our staff members came right before the board meeting and uh, Dr. Jerees Butterfield did the training and it was great. And our last session we had 50, about 50 of our staff members and these were in addition to the, the corrective action meetings that we've already held. So there was a, a question that you posed last time about the, the review that was held four years ago. And so having not been here, I did try and find that review 
Um, we couldn't find it in our office, so I did put a call into the State Department to the consultant that we've been working with. Um, she did pull it up for me. She has sent it, but I haven't received it yet. Uh, but she did comment uh, that she, she knew about the process that we we're doing because I had, um, I had been talking with her all along. Um, and she knows how intense uh, of a process that we are doing right now. She did comment that it would be like apples and oranges for me to compare what we're doing now as compared to four years ago. So uh, the only document I could find, um, I did find one document, and it summarized the results of the four year ago self-review. And I can tell you what those results were according to that document. But again, that's not an official document from uh, State Department yet. Um, the report four years ago found four systemic errors. Um, that is, is really um, difficult. I would say difficult to find only four systemic errors in any district, uh, let alone a, a district of this size. So um, I, I just suspect that the process wasn't as intensive as it is currently. So if you're looking for the number four versus um, what we have uncovered is about 39 areas that we are looking at right now. So that's not going to look like progress, but I think that the, the um, method was a lot different. So just to give you an example of some of those areas uh, four years ago, there was an annual IEP timeline that was exceeded. That was one of the systemic errors. Um, a second one was um, there was no assessment plan in the file that would show parent permission to give an assessment. Um, there was, um, the third one was that there was not evidence of relationships between the levels of performance, goals and objectives, and services to be provided, so that there was not that, that link. Um, and the fourth was that the date of implementation of services was not specified on the IEP consistently. So, um, I also did not present our total results. The, the results that I've shared with you tonight about the 39 areas are those results that we have self-identified. We do not have um, our results back from the state yet. So we have done our final submission now to the state. We're waiting for our report. So that should come in a couple of weeks. And I can do a full board brief when I get that and do a comparison. Um, I, I'd like to just tell you a few of the areas that we found um, that are common threads right now that are problematic. And this uh, reflects the findings of both districts. So one of the, the, um, the new areas is the CMA, or the California Modified Assessment. That is a new area, and it's, it's very confusing and vague for staff to understand, so that's definitely an area that we need to address. There are several findings in that area. Um, a second one that we'd like to look at is behavior management, and we, we really do need to work with the staff on behavior management, implementing behavior plans, and that type of thing. And a third um, was to, uh, following up on Kathy's comments actually, to assess in all areas of suspected disability. So uh, you were right on with that one. Um, Let's see, so as I mentioned, we, we've already had two of our corrective action trainings, our large corrective action trainings, and, um, and I will follow up when I receive those reports back from the State Department. So that was about the self-review, and now I'll talk about um, our stakeholder work group that we held yesterday. So um, this was our sixth stakeholder work group meeting. Uh, we had approximately 23 people in attendance, 12 of those attendees were stakeholder members. And um, there was a question actually about who could vote, and those are the only people that can vote are the stakeholder members. So the staff, the outside staff such as myself, uh, I can't vote. So, so um, just so you have an idea about that. Originally, when I looked back at the, uh, the minutes, there were 30 official stakeholder members. So um, we had about 40% of our members present at the meeting yesterday. Um, we had two significant items that we were going to address on the agenda yesterday. The first being the transition plan for the stakeholder work group that 
Ms. Sawaski talked about at our last board meeting. And the second was a district-sponsored advisory group. Um, so we had considerable discussion about the transition uh, plan. And due to that, we had um, extensive discussion. We did not ever get to discussing the advisory group. And so we are going to have a follow-up meeting to discuss the advisory group. Um, there were three motions that I would just share that were approved um, unanimously by the stakeholder work group. And I'll just let you know what those were. The stakeholder work group has made progress toward its initial mandate and working through the subcommittees shall complete the latter two items in three months, which are identify possible entities for implementation and establish a suggested priority timeline. Two, that the action plan shall be completed in three months. And three, that each subcommittee work together with staff in completion of the action plan. So the intent of the action plan, I believe, is to name actual persons responsible to implement the prioritized recommendations, to have completion dates, and to have a specific evaluation or success indicators for the items. Um, regarding the advisory group, as I said, we didn't have any, any time to discuss that, so that will be in a follow-up meeting. Um, there were five FICMAT recommendations that tie to those to the advisory group, and um, those are in the FICMAT document. They were in a document that was actually the, the recommendations that were pulled out, and the reason that they were pulled out was it was a staff assignment. It was left up to the executive director to implement that. Um, let's see. So we will have a follow-up meeting. In the meantime, um, I did, um, I do, definitely want to collaborate with the SEAC group that we currently have, and so I have um, planned to meet with some of the members of the SEAC group, probably with Dr. Miller as well, and see uh, what compromise we can come up with, and, um, and then we'll come back to the next meeting to discuss that. Any questions? Any questions? Mrs. Deacon? I guess this is more of a comment, although you might want to respond to it. I think it really speaks volumes to the fact that the state approved the self-review four years ago that apparently was much less thorough than what you've done and only identifi identified a few areas of concern. It, do we anticipate that the state will do a more rigorous job of evaluating the self-review this year? Oh, I think so. I think they are, they are being very rigorous. Um, the State Department consultant has been down here several times. As I mentioned, um, she has already done training with the directors in the SELPA, and she's very, very involved. She calls quite frequently, uh, sends emails, uh, follows up. So she's very thorough, and I, I would believe that this is going to be a very thorough review. But she has commented many times that she's really impressed with our process. So do you think that's a reflection of a different philosophy at the s at in the California state now? I mean, in terms of assessment? Because it sounds like it was pretty lax four years ago. You know, I couldn't say. I, I know that, you know, the reviews that I've undergone in other districts um, have been pretty rigorous as well. But, I, but I'm not sure. You, each mm -hmm. region has a different consultant assigned to it, and so maybe there wasn't uh, as rigorous of a consultant assigned to this area. Okay. All right. Thanks. I also would just like to quickly comment on the stakeholder meeting because I was there as well, and, and I'm glad you clarified the point about voting because in some of the motions, including one that I proposed that didn't pass, although that's okay because I could live with the, uh, the follow-up one, not everybody voted who mm -hmm. was eligible to vote. And so I think we need to really encourage people to either abstain if they're not going to vote yes or no, but to really follow parliamentary procedure because it's it's a little misleading when six people vote out of twelve and, and you know that that appears to uh, mm -hmm. either be an up or down vote on a given issue. So mm -hmm. I, w I would just ask for that. Um, and I'm also disappointed that the group has waned in terms of numbers, um, but maybe that's an artifact of of time and just how long people have been a participant in this. I do hope at some point that the stakeholder group might be a resource but won't, will no longer continue to meet regularly, although I'm, I'm happy to have the group come back for the, this district advisory um, mm -hmm.
parent group because I think that's really important. And I know there were people there who came specifically to talk about that and left after two and a half hours not really, you know, having to talk as they were walking out the door because their child was getting stitches at the emergency room. And, and uh, so at any rate, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And by the way, I would like the board to see the handout that you provided to the stakeholders oh, sure. about the um, some of your goals for this, this parent group, because I think that would be useful for the board to have. But um, it was a long meeting. It was <laughs> an interesting meeting. I, th I think in the end we made we made progress, and even though it, at times it, it feels like, you know, two steps forward, you know, three back, whatever. But I think um, in the end it's good to get everybody together and just talk and let them have a chance to express their feelings. Mrs. Parker? Who is the chair of the stakeholders meeting? Who runs the meeting? Tom Guajardo has been the person who has started it. L yesterday I did a lot of the um, facilitating, I guess, because I started with, I was just going to be one piece of it, started with the transition plan or the transition of the work, the stakeholders work group process. We got so involved in talking mm -hmm. about that and votes and all kinds of things that it stuck there. So it looked like I was running it, but I was actually just one person that was going to be a part of that. Right. Dr. Mills was going to do the next part. Um, so there isn't an actual chairperson, although Tom Guajardo has been doing that throughout the year. He didn't, um, he just did the flag salute in the public comments yesterday. I guess I would suggest, yeah. I would suggest um, that um, even if there's only one or two more meetings of the stakeholders group, that the stakeholders group put a chair in place. Um, I appreciate what Mrs. Deacon has said about and what you have said about everybody being able to share their feelings, but we need more action and um, the fact that there now has to be a supplemental meeting to talk about the district advisory group is frustrating to me. Um, so I hope that uh, my next question is yes. when is that meeting going to happen? Well, we haven't calendared it yet. It, you know, it is the end of the year and everybody is so busy and we're trying to schedule it just as soon as possible. So I would say within the next couple of weeks. Okay, good, because uh, there's prep work to make sure that that's yes. up and running by the end of August. Um, and so I just wanna be sure that that doesn't get derailed or delayed because of sidetracking. Um, so I hope that it's productive <laughs> over the next couple of months. Yes. I guess I just hope that a lot of planning is already underway, mm -hmm. laying out some parameters, some choices, some options, some procedural things. I presume that staff can do a lot of that to get, you know, the parameters that can be discussed at that meeting. I hope oh, it's definitely. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ms. Cordero. Well, I had a couple of comments. Um, one is that the I, I've had a chance to look at the. Um, I guess notes or, or, or suggestions for the advisory committee um, that you passed out uh, at the meeting. And I'm just interested in, I guess I see a little bit of a disconnect between what's there and what was in the, the FICMAT recommendations for the advisory committee. Um, there, there, well, I see some, th it seems like there's some things that are some missing from there. So I'm wondering, um, are you going to, I is that going to be a collaborative discussion with the whole um, stakeholders? Will there be a new set of recommendations? How will that come forward? Yes, we had planned on doing that yesterday. Uh -huh. So um, basically I have the five FICMAT recommendations from, you know, that pertain to the advisory group. Uh -huh. We were going to discuss those. And what I brought was some areas that we could consider for the advisory group. So, okay, so let me understand it, because I think I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So your recommendations were in addition to yes. the, the FICMAT recommendations, yes. not, not intended to be the entirety? No. Oh, they okay. Were, they were okay, that um, makes suggestions based on my experience with a very successful parent group. Okay, so that, that, that makes with. more sense to me. And that Dr. Miller also had a, a parent group where she was from, and she had very similar things. So they so were suggestions, and we were going to discuss them. Okay, so you'd be yes. adding those two 
what the FIC met yes, report if the recommended. Group okay, that makes more sense. Decided to do that. The other thing that I had was just sort of a procedural thing, and I, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering. Uh, I, I know that our updates, and in especially for for example tonight, you're talking about a meeting that took place yesterday, so I realize that there's a, a real short timeline because it's an update, but it would be helpful, I, I feel, to get some of this information in our packet. Sure. Um, that was something that we had, we had asked previously, and uh, some of those were a lot more um, realistically they, they were easier to put into the packet because they were presentations that were being made to us, et cetera, but they were available ahead of time. Uh, but to whatever extent is possible, bec uh, it would be nice to have right. a it's little my goal bit as of well. maybe, <laughs> so even if yes. even if it's just an outline of the topics that you plan to talk about, okay. it would be helpful, I think, to have it in our packet. So sure. It, but I have to speak up here too, if you don't mind, because sure. I, uh, Dr. Mills asked me whether she should bring just a few lines and I said you know because we're bringing it into the board meeting and we just had the meeting yesterday let's not right now but she said I always like to bring something and have it ahead so I'm glad you brought it up because she had an opportunity to explain that she normally does that and I actually right. said tonight we'll be fine without it from now on we'll do that thank you Dr. Noel thank you for your report That's uh, is someone's cell phone going off. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm I. Uh, it's like two different discourses. Uh, you're talking about the self review, and and uh, it does seem to, you know you talk about 39 areas of concern. Uh, I got three of them written down. Uh, on the other hand, we've got uh, FICMAT with 153 recommendations. And I, what, I need a translator. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I need to, I, I'd like to understand the relationship between the two. Uh, and, and in that sense, uh, uh, it might be helpful, uh, apropos of the putting things in, in the board brief or it's giving us hard copy. It might be helpful, helpful for at least for the board and, and for the stakeholders to see, a, is there such a thing as like a template for this self-review? Oh, yes. It might be There's very interesting to see that uh, might, uh, because it might call our attention to things that we're not paying attention to. Uh, I don't recall, a, I, I've, it's been a while since I've read the 153 FICMET recommendations, and I have read them mm -hmm. many times. Uh, but I don't, but you use language that's not even included in that. Behavior, right, well there are two separate, management. two completely separate processes. So the self-review is more of a compliance document. It's, it's checking for IEP compliance. And so it's looking at all of, the, all of the legal aspects of an IEP and whether those okay. are in place, whether well, we are following the legal processes. The, and we paid 50,000 and we've spent that, at least that many hours studying and talking about the mm -hmm. uh, can you relate the, t the one to the other for us somehow? Um, I, I probably could. Yeah, okay. one is a compliance document and the other one is much more thorough in, in many areas. So you're looking at well, really FICMAT's legal, about, just FICMAT's legal aspects in the self-review. Yeah. Well, if I may, I think FICMAT says we do a lousy job on IEPs. This training okay. is to counter that. And so yeah. what they discovered so were so the that, reasons so this we... this whole review focuses on the one or two things FICMAT says about IEPs? The self-review is all about IEPs and all about the legal aspects. Okay. So yes. how do we keep out of trouble? Yeah. You know. I, I, well, and, and maybe the others wouldn't like to see it, but I'd sure like to see a copy of the kinds of questions they ask. Oh, I'd be glad to provide that. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. I actually did a whole training manual that I could share with the board. Now, uh, now let me talk about the stakeholders meeting for a moment. I was there, too. And uh, uh, I think I, 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 hear, I hear kind of a concern about it took too long. Uh, and I agree, it took a long time, not too long. Uh, it, and the reason it took time was because it was forging consensus. And, uh, and, and uh, on the issue, on the first issue about the transition plan, there was no consensus to start with. 
uh, and it took it took time to hammer out a consensus, and it was done, yeah, with 20 people. Uh, it takes time because everyone has the right to be heard, and I think maybe everyone has something to contribute. But uh, it's time well spent if you if the result is consensus among the stakeholders of, of for special education. So mm -hmm. I, I commend the group. We have public comment. Mr. I d just want to say one more thing quickly. Um, so everyone knows that we also listen to staff talk about all the things that they have already done and are doing. Um, I don't want people to think just because we've got an action plan coming in three <coughs> months that, that everything's on hold until that right. is. Um, I mean, Michelle Britton Bass made a real point about the fact that she's not waiting. She's moving ahead, and I know you are too. Yes, and so definitely. Um, and I know that, that the subcommittees of the stakeholder group have seen a lot of discussion about what's already been done. So. Yeah, good. Good. Okay. okay, we have public comment. Jennifer Griffin, followed by Lourdes Uribe. Two, uh, two minutes. Two? Okay. Two. Um, I just thought, uh, forgive me for repeating myself for those who have already heard this. But um, I brought to the, to the stakeholders meeting yesterday this little article that was in the Montecito Journal. And I just wanted to mention it again. Um, it was written by a senior at Santa Barbara High. And I'll read the first couple of paragraphs. Um, the hallways sometimes smell delicious. Maybe you've noticed, as I have, the aroma of baked goods that occasionally wafts through the main floor in the basement. It wasn't until this year that I discovered these smells came from the special education classes cooking. After four years at this school, I still have only a vague notion of the special education program at Santa Barbara High School. I do not know where their classroom is, how many students there are, or what they do there. My ignorance may be unusual, but I don't think so. I've never heard anything about the special education program in the written or video bulletins, assemblies, or the school newspaper. I have never talked about it with classmates, nor have I ever heard it mentioned by a teacher or staff member, blah, blah, blah. So it's you get the point. I mean, it's, it's really... I. I've been involved in some of the disability awareness presentations. I, I did presentations at, at three schools, and I want to do it at every school next year. And I have a daughter who's graduating um, from Santa Barbara High next week, and I have a daughter that's entering Santa Barbara High in the fall. And the one who's graduating said to me, I, I asked her specifically, did you get a disability awareness day? And she said, no, not that I know 30 of. 30 seconds. Now, I don't know if they did. I, I'm assuming they did. Um, so what I would like to be, I would like to be a part of improving whatever it is they did get at Santa Barbara High next year because um, clearly whatever it is they got wasn't got by many people. And I really hope, I'm pleading with you because everybody in this room, for the most part, did not grow up with disability in their, in their environment. And now our kids are, and the ones that I'm presenting to, they get it completely. It's us. We're the ones that have to figure it out. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Lourdes Uribe. I'm just making sure I know what time it is, so I know how to the do this. The red light will come on when you're done. Um, two of my kids were uh, students of the Santa, ba Santa Barbara School District while all this uh, stinky and... Uh, very bad handling of the special education was taking place. I've been in a special education for 15 years. I have uh, straightforward questions. Um, there's something called uh, compensatory education when you didn't fulfill your responsibility of educating a student. Uh, there's the law um, provide compensatory educational services. And my question is, since um, Mr. Guajardo is about to go, and he's the one who was handling my two cases with my older kids. And then they were transferred to Dr. Miller. And uh, now I don't know who is to be helping me with my two students. Uh, I've been given letters and notes and put in the stamp and uh, trying to get communication. I'm not sure if Tom Guajardo is sending me one expensive $5 uh, certified letter. Uh, a phone call will be just fine with me. $5 is a a lot of money, you know, to send just, we want to meet with you and talk about compensatory educational services for you two kids who are 20 and 24 who didn't get an education. 
in this district. Um, Dr. Karen Mills, I don't have the pleasure of uh, ever talking to her, our new, our new director for starting July. It'll be very nice if she could um, address those two pending cases or to be told straightforward with a phone 30 call. Seconds. If I wanna file for hearing, mediators with the state are wonderful, but I think we should deal with things here at the school level. Uh, I love mediators, but I don't know. I think they're paid by adult taxpayers' money. So either Carrie Mills or Dr. Miller or I don't care who, just talk to me and let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uribe. We will contact Ms. Uribe. Uh, uh, Dr. Mills, I have one, one question ahead. further. I noticed uh, I got a copy of a new document called List of Priorities uh, for the um, what used to be the action plan. When are we going to get that back as uh, for a document that we can approve as these are your marching orders, these are the priorities? Uh, those were distributed yesterday at our stakeholders meeting, so I can bring it back here to the board if you'd like. Well, well that's what that I like. Okay. I, I, I want us to approve the priorities that you've been working on and uh, if it's in a piece, if it's in a situation where we can't approve it. If those are the priorities that you're set out regarding yes. FICMAT, then I think we need to approve those. Okay, I will bring them back next time. Board, in order to get Mrs. Roski has a oh. question. I, I just, I, I was just kind of going, oh, okay, because we haven't really known exactly. We have those list of priorities, and we talked about yesterday in the stakeholders work group that then staff would design an action plan. You can't design an action plan until you have priorities. When we have the priorities, we were under the impression that the board wanted to approve an action plan, but we can certainly bring the priorities back. So I guess we just, we just yeah. sounds the like the it's clear The motion that was made August had nothing to do with an action plan. I, I agree. It had nothing to do with an action plan. The priorities you need before you can do an action plan. And so I want to approve the pro I personally want to approve priorities. I guess I'm, I'm trying, I mean, uh, it's been, I can't remember your motion from last August, but was it for the, uh, to come back, back for a board approved priorities list or was it for them to create a priorities list? I mean, I just want to be careful that we're not overdoing the board action um, and thus impeding the staff work. Maybe it was, I could have been interpreted incorrectly. We, we have been interpreting that motion as, um, that we would begin a stakeholders work group, a stakeholders group, self, says, uh, go ahead and read it. Yeah, you've got it right. To review, consolidate, prioritize, identify responsible persons, and establish timelines for implementation of the FICMAC recommendations. So part of it was to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And you know they've reviewed it, they consolidated it, they prioritized it, they've identified people, they've established timelines. I mean, I think it's time to approve that document. I, I guess, and maybe it's because I've, I've been so immersed in this and have pretty much bought into the list of priorities as a result of all the discussion, it was never really my understanding that those priorities had to be approved. Now, yeah, the, the stakeholder group voted last night to go ahead and move forward on this action plan, and the action plan is based on those priorities, so if those if you feel the board doesn't agree with those priorities, they need to know that before they, and, and Dr. Noel has actually entered all, all that information <laughs> already yes. into a computer program, but personally, I don't need to approve the priorities. I, I think they're okay, and I'm not sure that the district, or the, the board necessarily has to, but well, I'll let everyone I mean, else make that decision. I mean, unless I'm way off base, the stakeholders group does not create an action plan. That's staff. Right. Ms. Godero? Well, I just have to, uh, even with my understanding and then with your rereading of it just now, I, I thought we directed staff to create that. I, I didn't hear, and in the language that you just read, it doesn't say that it needs to come back to the board for approval. Um, so I guess maybe what we need to, uh, unless you didn't read the entire thing, um, but maybe we need to decide then whether we need it to come back to us. I, again, uh, as others have said, I personally don't, I don't, I, I would feel uncomfortable having had the stakeholders group 
as well as our our staff in that area spend countless hours coming up with these priorities and then for me to sit here and quibble over whether those are the correct ones or not I would feel extremely uncomfortable doing challenging their their uh, opinions there so I I, I would maybe I, I, I guess I would feel more comfortable approving an action plan um, but I'm not I don't feel the need to approve the priorities. How much discussion, um, Mrs. Deacon and Mr. Dr. Noel, has the stakeholders group talked about those priorities? How many times have they discussed in depth we those? We discussed in months. And, uh, each, each of the uh, priorities? Uh, that's uh, the it's been on priorities. The I mean, they're, they're reflected, I think, in, in uh, Dr. Uh, Miller's uh, 24 points. Uh, the the, uh, the latter two parts of that motion go beyond the priorities and talk about uh, identifying who will implement and the timelines. And, uh, and that was the distinction that the stakeholders group voted, voted that those are the things yet, yet to, to, be, to be done, but that that's part of the action plan, if I understand it correctly, and staff is gonna do the action plan. Yeah. How many different in sets? In, and the third motion, was it not? Help me out here. But the third motion that, that was passed said, in collaboration with the committees. Yes. It says that each subcommittee work together with staff in completion of the action plan. And, say, and, and, and I guess, please. And, and then at this point, three months, right? Uh, yes. Then the stakeholder group's gonna meet and here and look at this draft action plan. My, and, and I don't know that we decided this yesterday, but in my mind it was yes, and they're gonna say, we love it, uh, we're gonna, and uh, we urge the board to adopt it. And, and from then on, it's staff, it's staff's job to implement. I, I'm, I'm looking around because I'm only one pair of ears, sometimes not real good ones, uh, but that's the way I heard yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Mrs. Parker? I mean, regardless of whether or not we, we should take action on it, because I think we probably shouldn't, but we do need to have it, and I would hope that it would come back at our next meeting as part of the special education update. Um, I'm also now questioning, though, why the stakeholders group is involved with the actual action plan. Can I clarify that? Um, the staff is creating the action plan. Okay, so it's just going to... You just have a, a look see by the stakeholders. It'll come group. back okay. to the stakeholders group, um, and it'll also be an update on progress for those things that are already being implemented. Now, the stakeholders group may very well want to provide input into that action plan, mm -hmm. and, and that's certainly, you know, a function they right. can provide. But, okay. but I just I just want to address Mr. Heron's point because I I think we would be going making some giant steps backwards if we as a board asked for the whole priority piece to be revisited. I think the whole group has moved beyond that. I don't think that anything about revisited, just a approval. I'd, be, I'd challenge anybody to find the right set of documents that we've had a different set of documents probably four different times. Mm -hmm. you know. And so if there's a correct set, maybe we should at least see which one is the correct set. It is a work in progress. I, I grant you that. I, I'm just a little concerned about opening that all back up again because I think we've moved beyond it yeah. and um, I just can you, I, I, can you give me, me the correct set yeah Carol yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, th I think we've got a correct we've set. got okay. everything and we've that been was working passed with that yesterday. set for so uh, I, I wanted to uh, try to answer uh, the Mrs. Parker's uh, uh, concern the uh, as it worked out the stakeholder group broke down into committees Communication, uh, training, uh, professional programs, development, programs and services. Right? Yeah. 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 A and uh, and no single no staff member was part of any of all those groups. So so there's kind of a corporate memory, uh, and and those groups dealt you know in considerable detail. So there's experience and memory there that staff hasn't got. A and so I think the vision yesterday was that that, that as staff develops this plan. Uh, these subcommittees, and it, now obviously it's not going to be a big, three, a big group. Probably a couple, three people from each of the subcommittees uh, will coordinate with them. 
and work with them. And I don't think that wasn't formalized in any kind of like you're going to have so many meetings or was it that was left as an informal no. coordination? Right. No, there was not a meeting number that's, that's specified. I can't. I can say though, you know, in regard to the priorities, at least in the program and services committee that I was chairing, we were using those priorities as our guidance for right. the entire time. Yeah. The word priorities didn't come up till yesterday. It's no, always I know, been, but it's always been an action plan. It, right. It had never been referred to as exactly a list of priorities. those items. Yeah. Well, well, the uh, the 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 subcommittees early on, uh, we sat there for hours prioritizing. And, th and that was input to Carol and Marilyn when they did their, their work. I know that. Um, we have public comment, if we're ready to go there. Marsha Eichelberg. Anyway, I just, my really very quick comment, well, excuse me, this evening is my understanding was that as the subcommittee, we were coming up with priorities, action plan, the words keep bouncing back and forth, but the thing is, the things that were most important to us, and then we were to make recommendations to the board. We have been, to every single meeting we've talked about, we can't make the decision. We are making the recommendations to the board. And so I guess I took it, and I believe my fellow parents took it, that this was going to come back to the board for approval. And I think we feel that that is important because, um, you know, we feel that this was like a direct communication to the board so you guys really know what's going on. Since there's only two board members, we want you all to know what's going on. So. I guess I'm a little bit surprised because I kind of, I have to say I agree with, with Mr. Heron's recollection of what we thought this process was going to be, was that we were going to make recommendations, bring it to the board, and then the board would say, we give this our blessing because then you guys are going to be able to have the accountability, right? I mean, you're going to be able to say, we know what's going on, we know what we approved, and we want to stay in the loop here. So that's... Can I ask a cycle yeah, question? Do you then are you saying what you have already is what you want to come back to us for approval, or what to you are still developing is what you want to come? Well, to be honest, I think we've gotten very close. This is just my I can't speak for everybody. This is just me. I think we've gotten pretty close. But I actually thought yesterday we were gonna spend some time to maybe one more time, go through the list, and make sure everything is on that list that we all believe needs to be brought forward to you. That was what I thought was gonna happen. And I would just add, I don't think the stakeholders set our priorities. I mean, I think they can give us suggestions. I think we need to adopt the priorities. So that, I'll end it there for me. Mr. Heron, may I make another? suggestion yes I believe that progress will be more palpable I believe that you'll get a more comprehensive report with backup materials as you move the special ed report to once a month rather than every two weeks uh, as it stands it's more of an on-the-run reporting and I think it needs more planning and, and presentation Mr. Cordero? Well, I just want us, I, I, I don't want us to leave this hanging. I, I want us to, to take whatever action we need to take, either decide it's not coming back to us or decide that it is coming back to us. But I feel like every time we talk about this, we debate some issue over and over and over again, and it's keeping us from moving forward and getting on with it. So. And and I, I don't think that what um, I wouldn't characterize the priorities as they've been established so far, as the stakeholders' priorities, uh, as them making a decision because our staff, and even board members, have been involved in that 
in those discussions. Um, but if if we if bringing it back to us moves us forward, I'm all for that. I don't want to spend a whole lot of t more time debating whether it's going to come back or not going to come back. I want us to just do it and move on because we need to deal with it. We need to get the get to the real issues and, and to the real work. Yeah. So whatever's the board's pleasure, but let's just either decide it's coming back or decide it's not coming back and move on. Dr. Uh, Newell? I think we should, I think we should uh, accept the recommendations that were voted upon yesterday at the stakeholders meeting and add uh, or underline the, the uh, timeline uh, that the action plan would be done and uh, it's going to go into three months. And 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 and, uh, uh, and and the uh, and that is all based upon and, and here, Mr. Heron, maybe you don't uh, uh, understand one another's perception, but that is based upon the 24 point document, uh, 24 items that uh, Chair Miller and uh, and Marilyn Lauer produced, which which I believe most of us have taken to reflect a set of priorities, and I. I don't, the board even, the, we, we've considered those at the board, have we not, a, and kind of. A brand new document was presented yesterday that three of us have not officially seen. What? Say that again? A brand new document was presented yesterday to the stakeholders that three of us officially. I think there were very few what changes in that. Yeah. There were what a couple items in bold, and that, you know, yeah. I mean, I might be wrong, what because you mean? get cross-eyed after you've looked at, you know, all these ten versions, but. I don't think that prior what's now being called the priority document has changed much since the last version. Is that right? That what I, just a I little just bit. Dr. Dr. Noel? Point of information, what, are you, what is the document yesterday that you're re referring to? That it, it, you got the document that says... Um, at, I, the I work, at, the, at the work group meeting yeah, yesterday. Yeah, I, I mean, I have went a lot in the car. I don't remember each one of them. I've seen it, but not officially. And the the revision i think there was one additional item that had been left off dr miller talked about she added it in and some of the it says revised timeline at the top and so some of the dates that have been passed already we added a an updated timeline for when it would be completed those were the changes but the but the priorities themselves did not change that's correct if well, that okay. has not been seen by all the board members, then I need to put it in the board brief so that it is available to all board members. The most recent document would be nice to, sure. to see. I'll, I'll and uh, well, there, this is a whole packet of documents. Yeah, kind of which one is he talking about? There's one dated um, <laughs> April 24th, May, 20, uh, May 24th. That's now, that's now called priorities. So again, all of this was just this done this yesterday. That part of our discussion yesterday was that this bore no bearing to the 24 points, that, that, that it was so unrelated to the 24 points that it, Carol it is and Merrill had produced. It is the 24 the points. points. This is the 24 yeah. points? Yeah. And over the past I'm couple months, Tom on. added seven or eight I'm to it. This one. Yeah. Okay. This one's not. No. Yeah. Well, if you say it's the 24 points, in what sense is it new? This now determined as priorities, not an action plan. Uh, there's seven or eight that are missing that Tom had added over the last several months, and now that they're not in anymore. And so, th and so your and your point is you want to adopt this. I just want to get one that we finally adopt, Pardon? and say I want I want to finally adopt one that we say this is it going forward. Yeah. And. And we set the priorities. The stakeholders don't set priorities. Now you're very close to it because you've been on the stakeholders group, as has Mrs. Deacon. But um, I, I think the whole discussion yesterday was predicated upon the, that this is what we're working with. Right. Uh, er, I mean that, and, I, and it's been, I think, the board's assumption yeah. from Mrs. Uh, ever since Carol and Marilyn produced it. For the sake of time and moving us forward, I'll move that we bring this back to our next agenda on our next agenda to approve. I'll second that. Right. Do we need to really vote on this? We haven't voted yet. By acclamation, I move by I acclamation. I don't know if it's by. No, no. I don't think it's by acclamation. No. I Can know. I actually uh, um, 
amend your motion, Mrs. Cordero. Please do. That at our next agenda, we bring it forward to accept the priorities. I accept your amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Carried unanimously. Well, you know, we could have, we could, we could do that right now. We, could, we vote off the conference. And Up to the next one. So I, it's your call. I, it's so late, I know. Well, uh, although they've been here they've all been night, here the yeah, whole for them to come back. I guess I'm questioning, what may, do we take the May revise? But we, we can. I, I could put all the May revise information in a board brief. It's ugly. Can, can you give us a... He can give you the I could give it to version. I could give it to you in five minutes. Give us, a, give us the five-minute version. Well, I need a couple of I think of we slides. need to hear that tonight. All right. Mr. President? Yes, Dr. Uh, uh, Moore. The, among the items I pulled on the consent agenda, there are some that, from my point of view, uh, are su substantial and uh, how will take time or could be put forward to another meeting. Okay. How, long do we, how long do you want this meeting to go, all of you? Until oh. uh, about 11. <laughs> well, well, l l let me describe my concern. Uh, to, to have this group come back will mean that they'll have to come back and sit again until we're ready for that item. And if we have a number of Let's action take, items, then the item. they may end up sitting for quite a while. Can, can we, are the, are the consent agenda items that were pulled items that can be put forward to the next agenda? Well, in the meantime, let's give it, give it a five minute yeah. we, we update. We can determine which ones okay. can. Okay, so I'm going to try and do this as quickly as possible. S as you know, the May revise is the second milestone in the development of our budget. Um, the governor revises his estimates, um, basically, that were originally cast in January. State budget deficits still estimated at $19 billion. Um, education fares better than the rest of the state budget. However, roughly $2.5 billion is taken from education, pretty much the same as in January. Additionally, child care will take a huge hit, $1.45 billion, and CalWORKs is on the chopping block. The governor tries to balance the budget strictly on the expenditure side with no new revenues. Um, most of the expenditures are aimed at, reductions are aimed at social programs. We'll put the legislature in a bind in terms of choosing between public education and social programs. Don't look for an on-time budget. Um, the governor has pulled back almost all of his January proposals, no targeted administrative cuts, no proposals to reform teacher protections, no initiatives to repeal contracting outlaws. However, we have some of the same cuts but in different wrapping. As you recall, there was the $191 or $231 per ADA revenue limit cut. Those are off the table, but in its place, they put in a 3.85% reduction to each district's revenue limit <coughs> applied before the deficit. This is only applicable to basic aids. Not, uh, not, not, yeah, it's not applicable to basic aids. It's getting late. Um, the governor's also proposing a $1.45 billion cut to child care. It would impact subsidized slots of 142,000 children statewide. Does not include state preschool. So we're talking about the general child care programs only. Um, and the reason they're doing this is they want to lower the Proposition 98 guarantee. Uh, Mr. Heron, a quick question just on that point. Um, also does not affect Prop 49 after school? That's correct. So this is really just that K-3 program? This is not after school care? It would be for, after school well, care. Well, it's after school for that K-3 program, but not after school for AOK. Not ACES, or, not anything that's created through Prop 49 or a constitutional initiative. Um, and obviously they're doing this to lower the Prop 98 guarantee because you know it, by reducing the ceiling you reduce the floor in the subsequent year and it means the state has to pay us less. Statutory COLA, as you can see, is still a negative COLA this year. The revenue limit deficit is still at 18.335%. We expect that to run out through 13, 14, 14, 15. Um, in the elementary district will be basic aid, but will be subject to the fair share reduction, meaning that basically they will take the lesser of the 5.81% against our unrestricted revenue limit or our excess property taxes, whichever is less. 
We anticipate our, un, our excess property taxes in the elementary will be 658000 We've got <coughs> to deduct that against our categoricals. Meg and I were working on that today. We think we will have this probably resolved internally before we come up to budget adoption. Um, the state will continue to capture the excess property taxes until we reach that threshold of $1.5 million. After that point in time, then we get to collect excess property taxes, <coughs> and that's how the fair share calculation works. Um, the reduction is ongoing. It's not one time in nature. So what I'm saying is you reach excess property taxes up to $1.5, we keep paying them $1.5, and then the dollar after $1,529 becomes ours. High school district isn't as lucky. The 3.85 revenue limit cut equals to $2.6 million. Based on revised property tax figures and projected COLAs, we anticipate the secondary district will not go into basic aid status, will remain in revenue limit, meaning we'll subject to that cut. Because the magnitude of the revenue loss is too large to deal with between now and June 30th, and because we have sufficient reserves, We'll be crafting a plan and bringing back stuff in the fall. Um, budget is, these are risks the governors may revise. I'll just let you look at them real quickly. What should we expect? Protracted, protracted budget battle, financial troubles probably will affect California's credit rating again, slow economic growth, fallout from ballot initiatives and court challenges. So, not a pretty picture. Thanks. And that was the quick report. Yeah. Should we be reconsidering our decision to um, not allow interdistrict transfers? No, because here's the issue, is that you're on the cusp. And so you're so closely on the cusp. If you lose, I'll give you a good example. We've been losing in the secondary district for several years, 250 to 300 students a year. Last year, we had an aberration, perhaps, it had only 100. Our projections take that into account and only anticipate we'll lose 100. If we end up losing 200, 250 to 300, it could drive you back into basic aid status. So there's just, remember, there's, there's three or four intertwined variables, cost of living adjustment or deficit on the revenue limit, declining enrollment pattern, and property tax growth, you have to look at all three of those variables, variables in combination, and you can't look at one or the other. It's a, how they all intersect. And it's a dynamic thing. You gotta keep looking at it, so. Okay. Mr. Deacon? Dr. Sarvis, could we ask that you clarify for the public in some fashion, either th through a posting on the web or, or maybe even a release, uh, this issue regarding child care because I am quite certain that many of the people that were here tonight will n their child care will not go away because that they're either in preschool or in, in AOK -okay or something like that and or I think that they have concerns about state funding and right. coming to the board will have no and effect on that right and the fact yes. that it's we don't fund it nope. and we have no control over it but I think we really need to set the record state because it's it's always frustrating when people leave not knowing the, the true situation, so I would like us to do that. And as I have written, this is a state issue. The state needs to hear from you. Parents going to the board will not affect state funding. And I've written more. Good. Got it. Mrs. Cudero, will you take over for a few minutes? We are at item F5. No, I'm sorry, we are not. F4. We are on item F4, presentation of the Dos Pueblos pilot program for at-risk students. And I know we have a number of people here to speak on this item yeah. to us. We and so do have while a you- have a number of uh, educational leaders from Dos yeah. Pueblos tonight. And Robin Swoski, our Associate Superintendent for Education, will introduce this. Yes, I'm, I'm very excited about what this team has done. And uh, uh, I don't know that board members know that before they started this at risk, this program, that they, um, they've called informally the academy. Um, I, it's not an official board approved academy like some of our others, but um, that's the name of this group. And they have collected um, data on uh, student discipline and um, student achievement data just as kind of a 
you know, they'll, they're sh they will share that tonight, but I know they have a full report on um, the program and the positive trend that it's showing. And um, one thing is that that is slightly different, I believe, than um, our other bridge programs at Santa Barbara High School and San Marcos High School is that this team has, they started before and they had this thought um, for a long time and they came together before they even knew about bridge program and funding and all that kind of stuff. So I'll let them take it from here. Well, thank you. That was a great introduction, <laughs> Robert. So thank you very much. Good evening and thank you for having us tonight. Um, I'm going to start with the basic question. Did you ever wonder why students are at risk? Did you ever wonder what would happen if you reached out and asked them how they are, what they're doing, how their lives are outside of school, and how we can maybe make life better at school? Showed them that there's some reason to actually care about school and that you actually care about them as human beings and not the numbers on the piece of paper and the test scores, but just how they are personally doing and that their success in school is success all about themselves. Well, I wondered it for a long time and I came to Dos Bubbles 20 years ago and I've been there for 20 years working as the at-risk counselor, um, looking at filling in the cracks and figuring out how to find the students who are falling through those cracks and how I could protect them. Finding teachers who would understand them and work with them, creating a daily program where I was working with students on a regular basis, mentoring them, tutoring them, and showing them that I cared more about who they were than how they were performing. And they stepped up to the plate by showing that, by giving that care, they do care. But very often, it's just band-aiding. It's I had a group here with these 10 kids. I had a class here for this group. I had an after school class for that group. Um, I started reaching out to other staff members because the school supported me in being the at-risk counselor. I needed a staff to kind of work with on these issues. So together we came up with the academy, which is what you're going to hear about today, but um, starting to find these teachers and figuring out where do we start. So what we did was, we started with identifying a group of ninth graders who spent a year at Dos Pueblos not being successful, interviewing and talking with them about how we can kind of implement something that could be successful that would be systemic and meet all of their needs as a group and not as an individual. And what I'd like to show you right now is their beginning stories. Scott. thought that it was a thing that I had to do, not something I wanted to do, so I didn't really like to do any of it. I didn't feel like my teachers respected me, I didn't, I didn't do my homework, I didn't listen to them, and if I had something to say to them, I didn't, I wasn't afraid to speak my mind. My mom, I really, because my parents are separated, and it's basically kind of hard for me. Sometimes I don't have um, time to do my work, so I'm too busy doing it, um, seeing other stuff. So I had to do chores and I had to help my mom because um, she's a single mother. But she has a boyfriend, but he doesn't really help her out that much. So I'm the man of the house. You know, my mom's already connect, but yeah, what can you do? Not everybody wanted to graduate, so I know the point of it. Just, just walk on stage, get a piece of paper. Ninth grade, I didn't see myself graduating. I was nervous, like at the last minute, fourth quarter. I was like, man, I'm not going to pass with these grades. I can't do it. I was putting myself down. Um, hi, I'm Heather Magner. I'm one of the teachers in the academy. And we just wanted to hear your story 
great to kind of give you background on, on who is in the academy and what we decided to do. We spent about a year um, Friday afternoons kind of coming up with a plan. And the first thing we decided to do was to put them all in a group that stays together. Um, and they travel together f through their first four periods, all their core four teachers. And um, <coughs> sorry, it's late. <laughs> um, while they were initially kind of resistant to that idea, it really has become one of the most positive, really most supportive things we could have done. Um, second, we really wanted to have teachers that were the most passionate about working with this particular group of, of students. Um, we need people who are going to be willing to be creative and willing to do kind of whatever it takes, sort of by any means necessary, to get this group of students back into school and back being successful. So what we did um, after the classes was try some other things when we got the year going. One of our most successful things was um, student mentors. We took our most capable students, our most successful students at DP, and paired them up. We had an application process and all that, but mainly we just paired them up with our, our kids, and the results were pretty phenomenal. Um, I think the best thing was it was great. I mean, yeah, this, they, they mentored them in academics, but they also showed them how to be successful students in class. And more than that, they saw that they had a lot in common and they could share like some life experiences together. And that was very powerful. Um, it was kid to kid, real listening. I could say it a million times. The mentor asked them, told them once, gosh, organize your binders. Watch, here's how I do it. Voila, you know, the light bulbs just went on. So um, the, the, not, the last piece that we put in place was what we call guided studies. Um, and we found that for them, in order for them to be successful in college prep classes, a big must is homework. One thing that our kids were not doing at all um, for a myriad of reasons. So guided studies, what we did was um, pair them with a mentor we didn't really have one-on-one -on -one ratio, but about two to three students per mentor. And in the end, the kids kind of, you know, some of our academy students, the best math students, helped the other kids with math, whoever was graded. So it, it became a, a sort of a, a working classroom with whoever was there. And we did it during the school day. And, and I have to say it was extraordinarily successful. What it really did was get a habit formed that, wow, this is, not that hard. You just knock out your homework, one thing at a time. Obviously, they couldn't get all their homework done generally in that one period, um, albeit they got the help they needed on the tough subjects and got the habit going, and, and most all of our students complete all their homework um, to this point. They did other things. They, they you know, learned to check grades and, and things like that, which were, was unheard of for them. Um, I always tell them what they learned to do in that class is how to play the game of school and play it well. So from that, we just want to share with you a little bit of our results. Um, and the first thing that we kind of looked up was discipline referrals. There's been a large change in the number of referrals from 265 from their freshman year to 56 um, or 55 about in the 10th grade year. But I want to note that it was the type of referrals. I was the one reading it and, and correlating it, and it was a majority of the referrals this year were f for things like tardy or cell phone violation, where um, the year before, it was the big stuff, defiance, drugs, fighting. So not only did they drop dramatically, but the types were, were very, um, you know, regular things that lots of kids, cell phone violation at the beginning of the year, almost everyone gets one, just to test it. Um, the next thing we looked at um, and really we're extremely proud of is the um, academic success. So the, the next one, Ryan, yeah. shows, okay. <laughs> it shows their GPAs. And in ninth grade, our average GPA was about a 1.2, 1.3. Um, and the third quarter, uh, right now, third quarter of 10th grade year, the average uh, GPA was a 2.5. So a lot of our kids have improved dramatically. Um, and we have quite a few students who are A and B students right now, um, and a couple shooting for their first 4.0. So given, um, all I can say is that the success that we've seen this year as teachers, we can only hope for much more improvements next year academically. 
and we are taking them through, um, you know, they're in college prep classes. They'll be doing the English 11 curriculum with, with me, um, chemistry. We decided chemistry, they, they loved it. He started at the end of this year, they did biology and they're doing great at it. So they're gonna be in college prep classes um, with support, um, with the guided studies and, and continue with mentors. And um, lastly, the area that I think that it, it was a, a result that we couldn't really put our finger on and measure, um, but it's the one that makes me the most proud. And so I, I'd like you to hear it again from the students because they can kind of explain it best. It's the unquantifiable that, that really makes the academy what it is. to struggle because I have the best teachers on campus. It's easy, you know, like, like I said, I don't know why I didn't do it in the first place. Like, it's really easy now, and I have teachers that help me, support me, like, I have a class where I can do homework in, you know, like, it's really easy now. I don't get in trouble as much. I actually pay attention. I understand the teachers and what I do. I understand my consequences. My teachers help me a lot more than they did last year. They they care more and they they're there for you if you need help and they just go back and just really make sure that you, you like know it before you they move on and they really care about if you really know it. They don't just want to teach everybody everything. It's a lot better. They're like really supportive, all the academy teachers, like they don't they won't give up on you. Like their goal is for us to graduate. They can explain the work better for me. They go step by step. So then that's good, and then I, they teach me shortcuts too to get to get what I want to know easy. They help me so much. Like it's I've never had teachers like these before. I gained like more confidence in myself. I've gained a lot. I've gained a lot of friends. I've gained um, respect for my parents. I can come to a classroom where I know I get along with everybody. It's fun with like a whole family. I good grades, probably gonna graduate. Yeah. I have like I think six A's and then B. I like being together with them because they're what I call a school family. I really like it because then you get to connect with everybody and then you kinda all know each other so it's not awkward at all. So you're good, you're all friends with them and it's really fun. I like it. Teachers really care and that's what it's about pretty much. Just teachers. I just really, really admire the academy and what my teachers have done for me. It's a miraculous and wonderful thing to see something so great. The academy really cares about us. Growing up, like, more mature, I understand to do things, stop bragging about it or stop um, whining. Like, you gotta do it and it just helps you out more. It's just great. Like, I'm thankful that they made the academy, but I chose to be in it too. Like, it's an awesome thing to be in, and you get the support and the help that you need. Good evening. I'm Bethany. I'm also a teacher in the academy, and I just want to talk to you briefly about our vision uh, for the academy for the next few years. As Heather mentioned, a lot of what our focus was for these students this year was just that, for them to learn how to become students. Um, what it means to come to school prepared with materials, what it means to sit in class and participate and interact with peers, interact with the teacher, to do your homework and then to turn the homework in um, and then to check your grades so you know how you're doing in your classes. So that was the goal for this year for them as sophomores and um, as you saw with those results, it was widely accomplished and these kids really have learned how to be students and that's been really exciting because they know that school isn't just this big bad scary place where they don't belong but that they know that they can actually do it and it's um, something that they can achieve so our vision for next year for them their junior year is to um, continue with their success in being students but to get them more involved with the community and we envision seeing them um, a lot of them are 
are, you know, begging for summer jobs. They want to get out in the community and they want to work. Um, we want to hook them up with internships with local communities um, or local businesses in the community. We want them um, to be engaged in community service projects, so not just for pay, but also for helping the community. And we really want uh, the community to see them for their worth, um, and we want them to be really to see themselves as a part of the community as well, instead of just this group of students who tax the community, but rather a group of kids who help the community and um, benefit from it. So that's our goal for their junior year is to get them involved with the community and um, really establish some partnerships. And so that's what we've been working on over the last couple of months. Our vision for their senior year then is going to be to take it a step further and help them establish a plan for, okay, what's next? We're gonna graduate, which is a huge goal in itself for them um, graduating, but then what's gonna come next? What is my life gonna look like for the next four or five, six years after I graduate Dos Pueblos High School? So um, again, we thank you for your time and Ryan's gonna finish us off. Hi, my name is Ryan Gleason. I have still getting over strep throat, so I gotta Forgive me for my voice. Um, my whole career, for five years, I've taught only AP students. I've only taught the group up until this year of students who everyone is willing to embrace. And this year, I really wanted the challenge of a group of students like this who not many people rush to embrace. Uh, in this year, I found that uh, it's been a really humbling experience for me that this group of students was uh, very, very challenging to teach. They, they had barriers to learning that, you know, we've all read about in books, but to actually see in person was, was really an indescribable experience. Um, some of these students have, you know, they come from abusive homes, they have no parents at homes, they lack the proper nutrition to be successful in class, um, they have a lack of acceptance, they're involved in gangs. Um, the key ingredient I think we've all learned is in order to make these students successful is to give them our un, our un uh, for lack of a better word, just a, a, a lot of time. They need our time. Uh, every, every week we put in seven to 10 hours of meeting time outside of the normal day uh, with this group of students or for this group of students in order to plan curriculum, to meet with them individually, to set goals for them, to pick them up when they're down, when they're, when they're not successful. Uh, while our passion will get us through uh, the next couple years, uh, in order for this program to be sustainable and replicable, what we need is we need the community to be involved and for the community, the community to be invested uh, in this program. Some of the things we're really looking for, as Bethany already alluded to, we need uh, people who would be willing to have our students as interns are willing to have our students um, involved in, in jobs. Um, we need people to donate uh, nutritional support or food. That's really helpful for our kids. Uh, we need people maybe to volunteer to be grant writers and help us fundraise and, and get money from the community. Um, what we're asking of you and why we came tonight is because you are respected leaders in the community who can help branch out and send our message out and, and maybe help us get these things, help us find these internships, help us um, spread our message. We encourage you to direct them to our website. And uh, the, the website, the address up there is the long version, but you can find it on the DP webpage underneath uh, academics. Um, we really want the community to see that this, these are students who, who would have initially taxed our community, and now they're going to graduate their senior year and, and significant, significantly give back to it. Um, we really thank you. I know it's. It's really late, and for you to listen to our presentation at this hour really means a lot to us. And we thank you for having us in, a, in what was already a packed agenda. So thank you very much. Have, have you been uh, contacted by or in contact with uh, Partners in Education, Michelle Magnuson, and her internship program? Uh, we are, this Thursday, uh, two days from now, we're holding an informational meeting for parents at DP where we're inviting certain community leaders and potential uh, donors uh, to that meeting. We've, we've been working with Just Communi Communities to help set up some of those donors. So without having that list in front of me, I'm not sure if they're coming or not. But no, that's Just something. make sure you contact, uh, and I'll get you the information. We'll, we'll, get, yeah. we'll get Ryan that yeah. information. Fantastic. Our school works really strongly with Yes. Uh, and partners of education through our career center and our career center is making a huge 
change in its outreach to do again transition. So we're working along with our career centers to also help us in the planning and the project. Yeah, and Michelle's part of that. Yeah, they have partnerships and they have internships. Paid internships. Yeah. Mrs. Cordero. I just have a quick question. How many students are in your program? Uh, right now we have 24 students. We started with 31, and um, in a program like this where you take your most at risk, you, we have to accept that there's going to be some attrition. Um, several students uh, ended up moving to other locations. Um, one or two students ended up in Juvenile Hall. So this is a program that has had significant success, but to be honest, there are some that have, have not made it. Next year, we're planning on filling those those vacancies and, and bringing the number back up. But uh, yeah, we are at 24 right now. Thank you. Mrs. Parker? A, com a question and a comment. Um, and that is, uh, so is it, are you gonna stick with just this one cohort moving through or are you gonna start a new group of sophomores? That's a, that's a great question. Something we've toyed with throughout the it seems like weekly in our meetings yeah. we, we consider that. We, we feel really strongly about our program. This program is really riding on the backs of, of passion and a lot of time. I teach four AP classes and this class alone takes twice as much time as those four AP classes combined. In order to find, yeah, go ahead. Well, just the, I, I think what we want to try and do, and the reason we were kind of holding off on um, replicating it for next year was simply to not make it another band aid. We want to try and get some things in place that can be systemic and replicated, so that the next group of teachers that come in and would follow, and with the ninth, you know, another tenth grade, and we do see it as being a three-year program at DP, but we didn't want to put them in a situation of, you know. He, yeah, here you get it, but now you're going to work 60 extra hours a week. So we're trying to put the supports in place so it's systemic and then hand it off. Okay, we well, certainly I, felt like we yeah. needed one more year before we did that. So this is one of the differences that I see with the academies uh, at our other two high schools that have been put in place, and that is those are sort of considered as one year and hopefully the kid transitions back into the regular program where you as see this as a three-year support program. Um, the one other, I, I think that what we're seeing is, is really tremendous and uh, kudos to you and you know, what a gift of time you are giving to these kids that will affect their entire future, so thank you. Um, but right now, uh, what, I'm, what I'm also interested in is you're only working with 24, but there's so many lessons to take from this group that you're working with and all the things that you're doing to affect the larger school community. And I know that that's something that Dos Pueblos is looking at. Um, great, great um, things here that can affect um, kids that are way above, you know, a 1.2, but you know, maybe they're at a 2.0 and really should be at a 3.0, um, and just connecting kids to school. So um, I, I think that's a very interesting avenue that I know that you all are exploring. Can I, can I say something to that? Yes, you may. Yeah. As to see this as, as 24 students, it, this is really, like you said, has really laid the seeds for a lot of great change at our school. Uh, we now have a, a school-wide mentor program that uh, students are, are submitting applications right now that's going to be implemented next year. Our staff, as a result of some of the things that start in the academy, is starting to have embedded support discussions uh, about how we can potentially change our schedule in order to better uh, support our students who have Ds and Fs at our school and improve our DNF rate. There's so many great school-wide changes that are, are coming out of the result of this team having the amount of collaboration time we have and being able to experiment with a group that has had as many struggles as this group has. I just want to also add that for every one of the kids who's in the academy, they've become a role model for at least one or two other kids in our school who are now seeing the ability to be success and watching their peers be successful has made them make choices of success even without being on it. Oh, so we have a couple that just come to guided studies, right? And I just say, okay. <laughs> and they come and do it. They're, so, yeah, it, it definitely, I agree with that. And we'd like to make it, um, you know, yeah, we'd like to make it bigger. 
Um, but we want to do it right. I think our biggest issue right now mm -hmm. is we don't, know, right. we don't know. You guys were talking earlier, and I really felt a lot about what you were talking about. We don't know what three years of this will do. And so to just keep starting it again without really having a base of seeing what three years will do, do we need I think it's a huge difference to really be able to invest in the three years to see that it was worthwhile enough to make it every year so that the next group that we come in will be the next group of 10th graders, and then there'll be a 10th and 11th, and then there'll be a 10th, 11th, and 12th, and it will truly exist as something that's ongoing, but knowing that it has success and that it works and that the kinks have been worked out as opposed to just more and more and more, as opposed to better and better and better. Hi, Mr. Deacon. Oh. Well, the questions I was going to ask have been asked and answered, but I, I so I'll make a comment. Um, we often hear that there's two schools in our high schools, and it, I'm really excited about the fact that you're literally bridging that by bringing these mentors in, and I think the multiplier effect you're talking about, where even the friends of the students in your group um, may benefit in some way from their friends' participation, so that's really exciting. and I. You know, you talked about the students that we embrace, those AP students, and frankly, we see them at every board meeting, you know, when we commend them for all their great awesome. achievements. And this was so powerful for us to see the at-risk students because they don't usually come to our board meetings. And I, I can't tell you how proud I am seeing what they said. I mean, it, yeah, seeing the growth that they've had um, is remarkable. Um, just their self-awareness of who they are, what were the mistakes and how they see themselves now is dramatically different. Mm -hmm. And they, you've given them a support group and that's what they needed, I think. Very and much. and so I, I really appreciate it. And teachers who do this are a special breed. Let's face it, not everybody's willing to take on this challenge. So I'd just like to thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Cordero. Well, I also would like to thank you. Um, at Santa Barbara City College and I teach the students who have often not been particularly successful in K-12, and so a lot, most of my students, or a lot of my students are, are at risk, so I just really appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate the, the extra time, because I know it is very difficult um, for teachers to be at, to voluntarily take on what amounts to a, a, a great deal of additional hours, um, and it's obvious that you're doing this out of a great passion for uh, beating the needs of these students. So I, as, as a, you know, one professional to another, I really applaud your dedication to that. Uh, and I just had a, a quick question. I just wondered, how did you choose the students that you, that you have? Or did they, did they volunteer? Did, how, how were they selected? Well, a um, couple ways. Obviously, a lot of them sort of self-selected themselves. They definitely identified themselves as students who were struggling but wanted to be successful. So that was definitely something in their pattern was they were in the office continuously. They were constantly, um, um, they were a daily thing in my office, so I was working with them. But their attitude was, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm coming every day and I'm failing and I need to figure out what I'm gonna be doing to be more successful. Um, we probably invited about 50 students to hear our presentation and invite them to be part of the academy. And from that, this, this is who signed up. So basically, it was an ask and answer. It wasn't your in. It was kind of like, this is a great thing for you, but you need to say, I want to do this for myself. And they had to sign something. And then we had a parent meeting explaining it to the parents. And the parents had to sign something also that they were involved and understood that their students were getting involved in something that was different yet part of the same school and as a way to help keep their students in our school and not have them leave our school. Part of Dr. Noel's question is, you know, we have these three continuation high schools at three high schools. It appears they're all different. You know, what happens to the students in the 10th grade that don't have the advantage of this? What are, they, what are we providing for them? I mean, we already have after school programs. We have support programs at lunch. We have um, morning programs that they're doing. Um, La Cuesta and Alta Vista are still programs that exist as potential options. Um, 
for our students who want to go to an alternative school or to go to a continuation in high school, um, we're constantly working at Dos Pueblos to kind of figure out what we can be doing to keep our students involved at our school as long as they want to be involved at our school. So most of our students who are dealing with credit recovery, we're offering these after school programs and these before school programs and we have a lunchtime program where students can make up credit so that they can remain at the school. Um, you know, as, as part of being the at-risk counselor for the academy, I'm also doing the at-risk counseling for the school. So they're getting a supportive environment through counseling and we're working on trying to give them the best scholastic schedule that they can be successful in. Um, again, it's much more of a band-aid approach. It's a 20-year dream of mine to be able to work with a set of at-risk kids where they have the same teachers and I could speak to four teachers about all of their homework as opposed to 20 different teachers about each different homework and running an after, if anybody's ever run an after school program, you know, I'm currently running but I, one. I think one of the things that was so, I mean, what we wanted to really pilot and try and have found amazing success with is like what we've called guided studies, is not having an after school, having it in their school day. And then it eliminated, it's eliminating a lot of the problems. If we can find a way to do that systemically at our school, which we did spend a lot of time, and actually Ryan, put in hours and hours and hours coming up with a plan that um, majority of our staff voted for, we just couldn't get the instructional minutes right. So, um, so yeah, I think the whole school is ready to do something different. And, and that's what this was about, is not just so, yeah, I think we'll probably always need kind of an academy for, we have a few kids that need a little extra, extra support. But I think most of our kids we could catch, given some of the things that we've tried here and proven to really work, um, if we can work out a few minute issues. Just to quickly add on to what Heather said, we, the academies, the, the, our law is to have the academy be the intensive care unit. And in three years, we hope to have created the intensive care model. While at the same time, we've inspired staff-wide systemic change so that the other 10th graders have embedded support among all, all, all content areas. Okay, great. Any, Dr. Noel? Yes, thank you for your presentation, and I commend you for the nice, the good work you're doing. Uh, I, I don't, what do you mean by systemic change? That, that's the last phrase I heard, and I've heard system, systemically many times. What, what? I, I literally just don't know what you mean. Sure, I mean when you have uh, a school as large as ours, a school of you know 2,400 students and a staff of about 100 teachers to get everyone on the same page with how we support all our students, to have the AP teacher be able to see why we need to support students such as these and, and, and find value in that, for to have the students who are in our engineering academy serve as mentors for this academy, to really get the whole school to embrace one mission, to bring student, to bring our DNF rate down, to bring our API and AYP, or API up, that kind of systemic change. I think for me it also means that all teachers are accountable, not just, you know, I've worked with at-risk kids for most of my career, um, sort of by just luck, default.